Hey, Mark. Uh, we're back again. Shashank, it is uh, great to see you. So, um, guys, we have an awesome episode this week. So, uh, today, uh, you're stuck with Shashank and I, uh, but we're going to go over some really awesome topics. First, we're going to talk about uh, Code Llama, uh, the new uh, LLM made by Facebook. Uh, then, we're going to talk about the Vision Pro, uh, its use cases. We're going to talk and talk about the rabbit R1. Um, but before we do that, I want to welcome you guys all to the number one generative AI podcast in the world. Oh, maybe one day. <laughs> well, we're getting there. And uh, this podcast is now worldwide. So Shashank, let's get into it. Awesome. Let's do it. All right. We're recording. Yeah, we can just start uh, talking normally. Um, uh, what, uh, what did you want to start with? Yeah, so I think there's a few topics to discuss, but one I wanted to, to mention is Facebook's new LLM. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Facebook just came out with a new LLM, uh, large language model called Code Llama. So it's the Code Llama 70B uh, for 70 billion parameters. It's pretty interesting because of Wait, the, uh, is that the yeah. open source one? Yeah. 70 billion. Yeah, 70 That's billion. Big. Yeah, 70 billion for an open source model. Um, it was trained, I was looking at their GitHub, it was trained on 1.4 million GPU hours. So, like, that's a huge number, uh, but uh, Shashank and I were just talking right before this about um, comparing this to GPT-4. And Shashank, what did you say uh, was GPT-4? 2.5 million GPU hours. So, I think uh, the way they put that is... Um, uh, 25,000 GPUs for 90 to 100 hours. So if you like extrapolate, uh, let's say Facebook trained these for about 100 hours. So that's about um, 15,000 GPUs for 100 hours. Yeah. So that's almost on the same order of magnitude as GPT-4. But what's really interesting is it's trained on only code. So like whereas GPT-4 is a more general purpose model, when you have something that is only code, like it's going to be really good at programming, uh, or at least it should be. Um, I haven't used it yet, but it's definitely something that I want to play with uh, later. I wonder if uh, GPT-4 was also trained on a lot of code, um, but I assume the memory overhead and the computation, or sorry, the training costs and inference is a lot more expensive because it's dealing with this big neural network that has a lot of information unrelated to code. Whereas this, um, even if it's trained on the same amount of coding information or coding examples, it uh, doesn't need to parse through a bunch of other unrelated training data in its neural network. So maybe yeah. it's uh, way more efficient. That's true. You know, one thing that I noticed a lot when I when I use GPT-4 for programming, it'll oftentimes give me the code, but it'll often have a lot of irrelevant information next to the code. Um, so it'll have, and I, I shouldn't say it's irrelevant, but sometimes like, you know, I just want the code and I have to uh, make it explicit in my prompt to GPT-4 that I only want a code as a response, but it'll occasionally not just give me the code, but it'll say, you know, a bunch of details about the code, maybe how I can use the code, some uh, thoughts on the code, just to have like a few paragraphs of text um, next to the code. But that's not exactly what I always want when I'm, you know, trying to use it for programming. Sometimes just like, you know, give me the data, give me the results. Yeah, I assume uh, when it gives you some additional context, that's probably fine and maybe even useful in the um, chat interface on the web or mobile app. Um, but if you're trying to use that as an API and use its uh, response as an input to some specific uh, feature where you only want code, uh, I assume you're talking about your uh, podcast generator or one of your side apps. Well, well, it wasn't the podcast generator, but I created a, a separate uh, side app. I don't know if I mentioned this on the podcast, but anyways, I'll describe it really quickly. Um, I created a, a small little project I called the GPT Engineer. So the idea is, is it simulates an entire company. So uh, it's it is all open source on GitHub. I can share it in the show notes, but uh, it will create individual agents where each agent acts as a 
uh, individual member in a company. So for example, uh, when you put in your prompt, let's say the prompt is, I want to create a pawn game. Well, it will go and first create uh, a set of requirements from the uh, product manager agent. Uh, and then it will break those requirements down and then give each requirement to a software developer who will then go uh, implement it. And then it'll have a code reviewer review it. Um, the software developer will then go fix the code. The product manager will again review the code uh, based off of like the original requirements. And then we'll have like some QA in there. And it's a, uh, just kind of, uh, a f there's a feedback loop between all of the different agents. And then it's able to write, uh, fully functioning programs without any human intervention. And, but if you want to, you can be uh, kind of like an agent or like an employee in the company itself. And, uh, you can uh, provide your own feedback, uh, to the code. So it it's, pretty decent for writing uh really small programs like uh some things that i was able to make was like a joke generator um it i've made like a calculator app um, a pong game a tetris game stuff like that like that are pretty tiny um anything that is more complex it started to fail but i really would like to use something like this code llama model uh to maybe produce some larger and more complicated programs yeah, I think uh, that's a really big challenge when trying to use ChatGPT to get a very specific kind of output because um, the amount of uh, control that you have over its output isn't um, um, isn't that fine grain. I assume that's why they added the toggle to get a JSON output because no matter how much you specify, like do this, only this, not that, it's um it's only going to give you what it has seen in its training data. So um, I, I was trying to create a bunch of uh, fake data, uh, a big JSON object with uh, a few uh, levels of nesting, let's say like uh, five or six, to create like a tree structure that contained uh, some overall categories, some uh, nested subcategories and individual little tree objects. And no matter how much I tried, it wouldn't give me the specific format that I needed or give me a deep enough nested uh, tree. So I feel like um, getting it to output only code and not the other text in the code might be challenging because it's been trained on a lot of Stack Overflow data, I assume, which has a lot of code and also people talking about the code. Yeah, that's a good point, which... Honestly, for a lot of things, it's probably okay because if I, as you mentioned, am just using GPT-4 on the internet, I'm okay with you know reading some text, right? But mm -hmm. when I'm trying to use this in programs uh, and do everything automatically, uh, I don't want that text to end up. Also, another thing is while you can uh, make it where it only gives you the code, you have to sometimes give like multiple examples uh, in the original prompt. And the problem with that is even though you can do it now, it shortens, uh, it, it, you know, it's going to cost you more money, right? Because if I have to give examples, then, um, and if I'm using the API, it's going to uh, make it so that I'm just using more tokens in my uh, original request, which is not really ideal. We want to make it as cost efficient as possible. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if this uh, code llama comes in a quantized version, because 70 billion is very big. Uh, I think they do have a quantized version. Um, I think we could find it. Because uh, how big were the uh, original Llama and Llama 2 versions? They had multiple. I think the smallest was 7, B, 7 billion, but then I think the Llama 2 actually had a 70 billion uh, parameter variant, if I remember correctly. <laughs> yeah, um, I remember trying to run these on my MacBook Air with the M1. And it was only the smallest one that was usable. And usable in the sense that I would get a streaming output on the order of a couple, uh, maybe like a sentence every second. Anything beyond that feels a little too slow for interacting. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be really interesting once uh, people are able to integrate these models uh, into uh, different text editors mm -hmm. for programmers. So for example... Uh, if you could have the even the 7 billion parameter model, but ideally the 7 billion parameter model may be available through some API, if that could be available on maybe 
uh, VS Code or Sublime Text or um, something like that, it would be, uh, I think, a way that you could really increase uh, developer velocity mm-hmm. without needing to manually copy and paste code. Also, um, if we can get these context windows bigger, um, you could start training it on your entire project and uh, it could offer more relevant autocomplete and even some like error checking or like security uh, scanning. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, building this into your code editor, having it uh, get context about your project by building some kind of a RAG application that uh, pulls in relevant bits of code from various uh, different files scattered around uh, different folders and using context from the internet, pick the right model, and uh, give you suggestions as you're typing with like an autocomplete um, that's making multiple requests uh, as, with every keystroke and also having something that you can um, talk to to get advice about the code. So I feel like um, that will probably require a lot of different kinds of models, not just one, because uh, each use case is slightly different. If you're trying to get an autocomplete, the challenge is getting um, a quick suggestion under like you know a couple hundred milliseconds because uh, that's the attention span of someone who's like um, waiting for instant feedback. As opposed to if you're taking a step back, thinking about the architecture or design of your code, you're okay with uh, um, talking to like the uh, Chat GPT four with its latency today, um, where you have to wait a couple seconds for each sentence to be generated. Um, so I was listening to this podcast, uh, No Priors, and they had uh, someone from Sourcegraph, uh, their CTO, and they were talking about how they used multiple different models to do exactly this, have a RAG application um, pick uh, a open source quantized faster model to generate autocomplete suggestions, which you need much faster, have ChatGPT4 um, deal with much more open-ended questions. Um, and it seems like we need multiple approaches. I wonder if Code Llama, um, have, you, have you tried Code Llama? I'm curious. No, I haven't tried this new well, demo. But it, it does seem pretty interesting. Um, while you're looking that up, when you mentioned like a fast uh, model and then a slow model, it kind of reminded me of the book. Uh, have you ever read uh, Thinking Fast <laughs> Daniel Kahneman <laughs> yeah Daniel Kahneman <laughs> yeah uh, it's a really famous book but it just reminded me of that where you have like uh, what is it called it's like the Think brain fast and yeah like there's like the brain one and the brain two mm-hmm. where like I, I think he might use a different term for it but it's basically like your automatic reactions and then something that you think about so for example mm-hmm. if I put my hand on like a hot stove I'm going to take it back really quickly because that's like an automatic reaction. I'll have to think about it. Uh, certain things like driving, um, because you know I do that all the time. Uh, walking, chewing food, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that. You don't really need to think about it. But if you are maybe given uh, put into an unfamiliar situation, uh, then you need to actually like really think about something new. And I think that um, you know it potentially like a way to think about our human brain and maybe. Uh, what you mentioned is like exactly what is required for AI models if we want to um, make it more similar to like the human brain. Speaking of uh, unfamiliar environments, have you uh, seen any of the Apple Vision Pro demos? Oh, yeah. That was a cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, I've seen a few videos online and it's pretty, pretty neat. Uh I, I don't. I don't think I want to get one because uh, it's a lot of money. It's a little it's, pricey. Yeah, but I, like, I, I part of me really wants it. Yeah, I'm. I'm trying to think about what I would use this for to come up with a good argument to to buy it. But uh, so far, it seems like it's a very good immersive experience, um, but very solitary. You're able to have a really big landscape to have multiple windows thrown around you and watch movies, videos, and the biggest screen that you can imagine. Um, and I, I think those are really amazing. But uh, in terms of new use cases that it can unlock, I haven't seen too many radically new experiences. So they have um, a couple truly um, first-party 
Apple Vision Pro specific experiences where it uh, puts you in a new landscape, a new environment where you're surrounded by mountains, trees, rivers, fog. Um, then they have a bunch of different experiences that bring the entire suite of Mac and iPad, iPhone apps onto this uh, device. So you can interact with most iPad apps um, as if they were native Vision Pro apps. Um, there's slight modifications and you can resize them, um, interact with them with the little um, dot that uh, comes around uh, when you use it on the iPad. As like a, a dot like a, like a cursor. Oh, okay. Um, so it's not uh, uh, as fine grain. So it has like a small um, area of focus. Um, and the area of focus is just where your eyes are looking, right? Exactly. So the difference between this and most other devices is it's eye tracking. You don't use a mouse. Um, only you could, I think. You could pair a Bluetooth mouse, but it isn't, uh, it isn't designed or it doesn't uh, encourage that use case. You stare at something that you want, then to select that, you tap your fingers to click. Um, and that's super, super cool, because I feel like uh, in the entire history of computing, since uh, the Apple computers first became popular and Steve Jobs uh, really ushered in the mouse as this awesome input device, it hasn't changed since then. The keyboard has been around for much longer since like the typewriter. And this is the first time you have a very quick, high fidelity input uh, by looking at exactly what you want, tapping your fingers to, together, and uh, you know, this seems really cool. You know, that seems like really interesting. I think for for certain use cases. Uh, so, for example, I think that that is potentially easier than um, dragging my cursor across the screen and then looking to maybe like minimize a window or maximize a window, something like that. Um, to go and like, you know, click on a physical thing. I think, you know, looking maybe faster. But um, one thing that I'm not sure about is would that be necessarily faster than typing? Because uh, right now, like with typing on a keyboard, I, one, don't have to look, right? It's not like I look at each individual key. Um, my fingers are already there and I can type, you know, like I think like maybe I'm not, I'm a decent typer. I think I maybe type like 60, 70 words a minute. Um, and uh, I, I think that, with that, I don't think I would be able to type at 70 words per minute by looking at each individual letter. Oh, God, no. Yeah. <laughs> that would be the worst way to use it. Uh, no, they they try to get you to use voice uh, as the input device, as the primary input device, which works fine for things that are in, you know, regular English or whatever your language is. But uh, if you're typing in like a Wi-Fi password or <laughs> yeah. you to a weird URL with a lot of hyphens and things like that. I think that gets a little challenging. Um, yeah, like how would you do copy and paste? Could you do copy and paste? Do you probably have some design patterns for that? Yeah. You like uh, grab it from in front of you. Yeah, that'd be kind of neat. Because they can see your hands too. Not just detect uh, pinching um, actions, but they can overlay a VR representation of your hands in front of you. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm with you. I think that the uh, the input uh, to have you look at things is pretty cool. Um, although I, I don't know about typing. Uh, also, another thing is, uh, you know, I don't always look at what I'm trying to do. Yeah. Like, sometimes, like, um, just in general, like, sometimes, like, you know where something is. Yeah. So, like, you when you're multitasking, right? Like, imagine... You are cooking and um, you're like stirring a pot, right? Mm -hmm. In like Apple land, you would have to like, you know, look at the spoon as it goes around uh, the pot, right? Um, but maybe somebody comes in while you're stirring the pot and um, now you can't like multitask because you always have to like focus on that particular thing. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because um, you were talking about uh, typing and it's not just uh, text and input that we type. We type, we use type to take actions with shortcuts, hotkeys, um, and we can do all of this without looking. So I don't know if just uh, eye tracking is uh, is sufficient to make this um, a rich experience. I feel like they should use language and shove it into an LLM and have that take more complex actions on your behalf, like um, um, add 
an LLM plugin into every Mac application or build that into the SDK and have all the APIs and um, actions that your app can take be exposed to this LLM so that you can just talk to all these apps rather than looking and clicking at specific uh, dropdowns and scrolling and things like that. Interesting. So you're kind of uh, envisioning like a better um, like Siri in a certain sense. Well, way better. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, it, it reminds me of that. Uh, what was that thing that you just pre-ordered? The Rabbit Rabbit R One. That's right. Yeah, they have uh, something called the Large Action Model. So the Rabbit R One is this uh, uh, little device. It's supposed to be half an iPhone, and uh, it's, got, it's got a tidy screen, um, a camera to look at things, and a little scroll wheel. And that's all. Um, what it's supposed to do, the way they market it, is you can talk to it and uh, sign in through your accounts, um, whatever apps that you use, Spotify, Uber, um, DoorDash. And it runs a virtualized version of all of your apps on some server somewhere, and you can talk to it and have it take actions within those apps. So let's say you um, want to book an Uber to the office um, and have, you, have it update uh, the ETA. Um, and, you know, uh, let you know when it's uh, ready to arrive. So you can take a bunch of actions, you know, um, select the kind of Uber that you want, uh, set the destination, um, select book, enter payment method, and then keep checking the app. Uh, or you can let this LLM learn from the actions that you're taking on the device and then have it kind of repeat it. Um, so what would be an example of an action that I could do that it would maybe learn from. So like, like from the Uber, um, yeah, like food ordering. Oh, so like I could, if I wanted to, I don't know, order pizza from Domino's, it could watch me maybe order the pizza and then maybe learn how to do it again. Potentially. I'm thinking maybe more repetitive actions because to order a pizza you probably want to scroll around or order food in general you want to scroll around um, select exactly what you want which might take a bit of trial and error but if you wanted to just keep opening the app to check the eta is it there yet is it there yet how long is it, is it going to take that's a repetitive action that the rabbit r1 can take okay so you're just like oh where's the food and i'll tell you oh it's this far it's going to take this minute this many minutes and he's on his way it reminds me a, a certain bit like a zapier yeah you, yeah mm -hmm. um so zapier is a uh tool where you can uh have a bunch of different independent uh applications interact with each other so it will uh so for example maybe if i receive an email with a certain uh subject in it then i could go and automatically write the content of that email to a spreadsheet or maybe I will uh, automatically move it to a uh, given folder or even I, I could do something more like if I get an email I could turn on a light because uh, you can do um, and you can cha train uh, not train but chain uh, different uh, actions together and uh, it'll essentially it's a tool that allows you to uh, interact with a bunch of different APIs and uh, put them all together without having to be a developer. It's a really powerful tool. So this sounds a lot like that, but as opposed to manually need to uh, chain them together, it'll do the chaining on your behalf and just handle it for you. Yes. Um, I would say it's very similar to Zapier. You can build rules and connect different apps and actions to get uh, more complex interactions. But uh, it's not just that it does it automatically. It can also do it with apps that don't expose an API. Because I think Zapier only works with apps that have an official API that's exposed. Um, or if it's not official, you know, someone's uh, hacked together an API and exposed it to Zapier. That's right. Actually, I, I wrote uh, a Zapier plugin once at a previous company. Mm -hmm. And um, you don't need an official API, uh, but you just need to make your code work with Zapier's mm -hmm. SDK. Either way, you have to expose an API that controls some function in some app. Yeah. And not every app wants to do that. And also, if you do that, 
for apps that don't support it, you need to maintain it indefinitely. As they change their UI, they change some param, they add some authentication, and boom, that integration is broken. The benefit of this um, is that not only does it get around the restrictions of not having an API on an app, it also learns patterns um, through this large action model, which isn't specifically tied to the UI as it is today. So I think um, the DoorDash food ordering example, I think it'll understand the general pattern of how to check for an ETA. So even if the ETA button moves from the bottom bar to like the left nav or something, it'll figure out that it needs to look for the ETA um, button and try to get that. So I think that's really cool for uh, repeatable actions. Um, just uh, one thing I wonder is, do you think that some people may try to do it for mm, something novel or new? Like, for example, I maybe like I would have it maybe order a product on their behalf where I'm not like super, I don't care that much about the specifics of the product. Like, uh, for example, if I'm ordering um, like AA batteries, I don't really care what brand. Like, I could just say like, hey, uh, Rabbit. Uh, why don't you order me the, the cheapest double A batteries you can find? Mm -hmm. um, like, do you think people will start using for that type of use case? Yeah, that's a good point. I just did that uh, for my smart door lock um, the other day. And yeah, it was the cheapest uh, from a good brand that I recognize. Um, and I think if you can teach an LLM to perform these gener generic actions, that might be pretty useful too. Yeah, I could like kind of free you up from things. Although I am slightly worried about giving the rabbit my credit card yeah. because, you know, you say it's the cheapest and then maybe it, uh, maybe the cheapest is the cheapest it can find, mm -hmm. which is maybe not like actually a great price. Maybe it's not a battery or maybe it's like 5,000 batteries that show up at your house. Tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It could be. Cause like maybe it goes on to, uh, Alibaba and finds the cheapest battery, uh, per unit is like a nickel. But it has a minimum order quantity of a million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you would need a human in the loop for this uh, as well. Yeah. Just to verify at the end, okay, this is its suggested action. It wants you to buy this from this vendor, which will arrive in these many days. You just have to hit yes. Yes. I, I think that's true. And, and maybe once I've used it and I've grown familiar, I would feel okay delegating more and more. Mm -hmm. But at least at the beginning... I would be quite hesitant about um, giving it too much power. I mean, even while working on this uh, podcast, I've had to try to figure out how to use Logic Pro, how to set different EQ presets, how to remove us, um, adjust noise. If we had a Rabbit R1 that could learn to do all these things and control Logic Pro, that would be incredible. That's true. It could be like, in a certain sense, you could have that, replace a lot of jobs um, like any type of data entry or repeatable task might be just replaced by uh, the r1 it just watches a human do it a couple times learns and then then that then that person isn't necessarily needed anymore to do that job which is you know maybe a good thing because if it's you doing it it could free up your time but it's not so good if if that was your whole job of doing like some sort of repeatable task. Yeah, so they need people to perform these actions to teach it how to do it. And uh, so to, to, just to back up a little bit, this is a $200 device um, without a subscription that uh, you can use indefinitely and it's going to run actions on its server. And I'm assuming there's some operating costs to running virtualized apps and running LLMs that take action on these apps, which is non-trivial. And the way they said they would make money is by uh, building this app store where creators can teach these models how to take certain actions, learn from it, and then sell those actions for people to purchase. So I'm, interest, uh, I'm curious to see if uh, there would be a whole new app store not just on this device, but other devices on the Mac where you are you have the Vision Pro, you're in this environment, and you can just talk to these apps, how they take certain actions. Um, and you can do that by purchasing 
these plugins or actions that other people have created on the mm-hmm. Sam's store. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty neat. And also, it'd be really cool if you could run all of that locally. So maybe in the future, once, let's say we're on the Vision Pro 12 or whatever, and uh, it's powerful enough to run some of these large language models or large language, large action models um, locally, and it's light enough where it could be ambient, maybe um, you'll just have a pair of glasses that are really lightweight, that have ambient information. That seems like the future. It'll just maybe take a while to get there. I don't see why you can't do it right now, at least with the Vision Pro, because uh, it's a very beefy device. Not only is it pricey, it has the M2 chip and uh, some kind of a specialized chip to do real-time processing. Um, but the M2, um, it's, it's an incredibly powerful machine. Um, I think you can run um, Llama 2 quantized models. Um, you can do it on the M1 that I have. Um, how was it when you ran it on your laptop? You have the M2, right? No, I actually I do the M2, yeah. Um, I was able to run some uh, quantized models, but it wasn't great. Um, the latency? Actually, yeah, it took a long time, and uh, it, yeah, it just, yeah, like, the time for each token was uh, a bit slow. Mm-hmm. Um, it made me want to maybe just create a uh, dedicated desktop for playing with LLMs, but uh, I got a bit of sticker shock at how much all these GPUs and stuff cost, so I don't know if I'm going to do that. I may just stick with some of the APIs, but it made me really uh, consider it. As an aside, I, I posted on Hacker News the other day asking what people were doing for uh, a lot of these LLMs uh, and how they were trying to run it uh, locally. Some people said that they thought like one of the best uh, bang for bucks uh, was the uh, in. NVIDIA uh, 3090 GPU because it runs the latest version of um, uh, I, well, I don't know if it's the latest but it runs a relatively new version of CUDA um, which is the uh, NVIDIA library to uh, kind of interact directly with the graphics card and um, and CUDA is mostly used for training right? I think it's also used for inference as well okay. if I'm not mistaken uh, although, I guess just run any uh, computation in the accelerator. Yeah, exactly. Um, but what was kind of interesting is uh, some people were mentioning uh, that you could use the uh, P40 uh, GPU from NVIDIA, which was came out, like, I think it was in 2016. Uh, so it's been a while. But as far as I understand, it's the cheapest GPU that you can get with 24 gigabytes of RAM, uh, like video memory. I'll... I remember you mentioning this a while back, and I was a little skeptical because an old GPU would probably be on an older architecture, or have like, um, you know, much bigger nanometer distance. And I was like, wouldn't the newer ones be faster? But then you said that uh, that's not the bottleneck, it's the memory. Right, right. I think my understanding for a lot of these models is it is. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, my understanding is the P40, the Tesla P40 uh, GPU has a 34.1, 347.1 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. Um, and uh, the 4060 GPU from NVIDIA actually has only 272 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. So hmm. I think like... Um, in order to run these models, uh, ideally you want to run um, the entire thing uh, in RAM. And if it doesn't run in RAM, then it will start uh, to throttle. So, mm. uh, But looking at the comments uh, when I was asking about it, a lot of people were saying they had to um, really kind of massage some of the drivers and uh, make it so that the software would work with these you know, archaic GPUs, even though they are... Um, you know, great. They're just kind of old. So uh, there was some assembly required. So I think that like you wouldn't want to do this unless you're a true enthusiast. Mm-hmm. I wonder if we'll start having um, LLM specific cards. Um, 
GPUs with specialized architectures to work specifically with the GPT or the transformer architecture. And, you know, you have a little card or a little chip in your device that's tailor-made for that use case. Oh, you mean like on cell phones or cell phones, laptops, uh, cards that you can stick into your PCIe slot in your desktop? Yeah, because I thought that um, some of NVIDIA's uh, newer GPUs, like the H100, were built with inference in mind, mm -hmm. although those are incredibly expensive. I, I think what will be really interesting is if they can get that on uh, something that is small, that you can run locally at low power because uh, you know it's one thing to you know put this in a, a server rack or you know a desktop computer that you're having plugged in all the time but if you can have this running in a cell phone or in the vision pro or um, some sort of like ar glasses that would be a game changer in my mind uh, even if it was like a so, so slightly quantized model um if you could make it uh Maybe useful for certain, uh, let's say, certain use cases. Um, I'm trying to think of like the particular use case that I would be okay with, like a hyper quantized model. Um, but I'm sure there would be, I guess, Siri. Maybe. <laughs> maybe, yeah. Maybe for like some simple uh, utterances, like uh, maybe, um, I don't know, asking, I don't know, how about to power NPCs in a game? Maybe. So instead of having the same routine dialogue flow that uh, the designers have put in manually, you have a slight variations that are powered by this LLM. Um, it's not mission critical, you know. It's not uh, buying batteries on your behalf. It's not uh, launching rockets. It's just powering an NPC in a game. That that would be okay. Yeah, because uh, maybe if I had that for my phone, right? Like if I have like a a mobile game and uh, I'm on an airplane. And I want to have a really uh, interesting NPC that I'm talking to, uh, then uh, the game could leverage this chip, which I think would be, you know, that'd be pretty cool. I'd be, I'd be okay with that. Uh, or maybe even if it could do some, I don't know if like general knowledge questions, but maybe like assistant type things, like asking it to like remember something for me, mm -hmm. um, which I don't know if you really need like an LLM for that, but. Uh, you know, maybe if I could ask it to remember something for me in like more natural language. Yeah, I think uh, most devices today are capable of doing some level of uh, AI uh, features on device. As uh, I know Google has been partnering with uh, Samsung to bring some of the pixel only features uh, to the Samsung devices and other Android devices too, I assume, where uh, the one they showcased uh, recently was circle to search. Um, you take a picture of anything or a screenshot or something's on your device and you bring up the Google Assistant. Um, uh, strangely enough, not uh, Bixby. It's uh, You bring up the Google Assistant on your Samsung. Oh, you run the Samsung devices. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So they just have both like Bixby and the Google Assistant running at the same time? I suppose, yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and you circle something um, and it searches it based on um, the, the image. Um, and uh, live transcription and uh, audio processing and the smart uh, image editing features in Google Photos. I think that's all powered uh, by the on-device chips. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty cool. Or maybe, uh, just thinking out loud, another use case would be uh, something to help you better use your device. Um, so maybe, um, like right now, um, if I want to interact with my phone sometimes i have to go and search through settings and it's not really obvious how to uh, change something so for example maybe if i want to change the background of my phone right like i have to go and you know I, I think you can like simply do it by long pressing on the home screen and uh it allow you to select the background but that's not actually obvious right and if i could just uh say like hey um my llm based on my phone like hey siri like change my background mm -hmm. and then it'll be like oh like what picture do you want to use and it'll i uh, change it to that or um maybe like if i'm looking to i don't know enable um like a setting like i want to enable uh backups or i want to like d just interact with my phone i i could do it in a uh, more user-friendly way like maybe i want to change the passcode i don't know exactly how to do that 
Yeah, that, that goes back to our discussion about large action models. Um, I feel like everything should be or can be replaced by LLMs taking actions on your behalf, um, especially for complex UI. Um, I, I know Google started doing this a while back, maybe because they have uh, an experience in search. But if you go to the Android settings, at some point, um, this was several generations ago, um, the settings page just got so complicated. There were so many options, so many nested features, um, advanced things you could enable that it was not feasible for the average consumer um, to figure out exactly where a setting is. So they added a search front and center at the top of the settings page. Um, I know Apple started doing that too, but I don't think they're that good at search and it's, it's a little hard to navigate. Um, but I could envision every app at least having a search functionality where you're able to uh, not just search, because you can do that already today, um, but also talk to the app, talk to the settings, maybe have an LLM just kind of understand what buttons and uh, knobs there are in the app and just take a stab at uh, automating the action itself. Yeah, that without any training. Y- you know, that that's a pretty good idea. Uh, I-, I like that. So as opposed... so. Maybe like right now the flow would be I have to search for, let's say I want to turn off notifications for uh, Facebook because I find it annoying on my phone, right? Mm-hmm. So I can go, I have to search for, the, uh, search for Facebook, search for the notifications and then go in and turn that off. I could just say like, maybe turn off my Facebook notifications mm-hmm. and we'll just do it, mm-hmm. uh, which, you know, would save time. And then I wouldn't have to like understand how the settings are laid on my phone or I wouldn't have to Google it, right? I could just, be I could do it or it could just, um, even if it wouldn't just do it on my behalf, it could maybe just give me a response and tell me how to do it. Maybe it could uh, talk, go into some of the documentation and uh, just tell me how to do it and maybe even have a link to the Facebook apps settings uh, with the notifications and just say like, hey, like click this button right here. Um. I wonder what kind of permissions you would need to build that out because uh, that's an OS level uh, thing, I feel. Because you're not just interacting um, with the exposed APIs uh, on the device. You're kind of like getting some root level access to uh, look at specific apps and all the features each app has enabled. Yeah, I I think that that would have to be built into Android or iOS. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I think there'd be no other real way to do that as a third party. It would have to be, you know, probably done by you know Google or Apple. Realistically, I, I think like there's a good chance they probably could. Um, I mean, they definitely can. I mean, it's it's Google and Apple we're talking about. They're some of the most valuable companies in the world. Yeah. Will they? Uh, you know, will that be the first thing they build? I, I don't know. Uh, it seems like a really nice thing to have. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure they're probably trying to weigh all their priorities, but uh, it, it would be, I, I think, like a pretty pretty neat feature and uh, really help you use your phone. Mm-hmm. Um, and desktop too. Any any place where you interact with a computer that has apps? Yeah, it would just make it make it easier. I know the um, uh, a Mac has uh, a bunch of um, search features like Alfred where you can get... Uh, um, information about everything on your desktop. So is Alfred? I haven't heard of that. Um, I don't know if I have it right now. Because I know that with the Mac, you can do like the command spotlight. space yeah, and yeah. like search of things. It's just a fancier spotlight. Okay. Uh, which um, allows you to preview files, uh, maybe uh, search the web through that uh, search bar itself, uh, search for contacts, um, drag and drop uh, images from that search bar itself. A lot of these features have been replaced by the um, Mac Spotlight itself, which is why I don't use it anymore. But um, things like that, I feel like you can get uh, get the user to grant you permission for your app um, on the desktop a lot easier than mobile phones. Yeah. That'd be a cool concept. That's really cool. I don't know. I feel like there's just so many um, ways that we could take this. Um, and uh, the future is bright. It's just exciting. Um, but... I think we're running out of time. We have to get to our meetup. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Um, and uh, before I forget, uh, this weekend we're helping uh, another community organizer uh, with a hackathon that will be 
a three-day rag-a-thon focused on building retrieval augmented generation apps from Friday through Sunday in Santa Clara at Datastax headquarters. Yeah, so just depending on when you're listening uh, to this podcast, um, right now, today is February 1st, 2024. Um, so uh, it would be uh, the weekend of, actually, it starts tomorrow, right? Yep. February 2nd. We'll try to get this boss cast out. Yeah, 2024. And then ends on the February uh, 4th. So we'll, we'll try to cover some of the ideas and projects that we see there and uh, talk about some of the interesting ones next week. Yes. So, yeah, just depending on where you are, because I think this podcast has gone worldwide. Uh, <laughs> that was fast. Yeah. Uh, look at the analytics. It's been all over. So thank you wherever you are in the world uh, and whenever you are listening. Uh, we appreciate you and love you. And uh, we'll see you on the next one. See you next week. Bye-bye.